want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Do like Jesus said, search the scriptures and you'll know what is true. Amen. And good morning and welcome to uh, What is Truth radio show. We're here with you uh, for an hour every Sunday morning on uh, Big Weck Radio. And so since we're here for an hour, I'd suggest if you could grab yourself a coffee or a tea or especially grab your Bible because we're going to search through the scriptures and we're going to do what the radio show says We're going to find out what is truth. What does the Bible have to say about certain things that come up in everyday, day and day by day things that we run into? So uh, normally we have Pastor Michael Caesar, and he's not feeling so well today. And so if you just keep him in your prayers, that he would uh, bounce back and feel better soon. So we're doing that, keeping him in our prayers. And so we have Brother Kevin Deegan here today and myself, Mark Sassy. And the two of us are going to look into the book of Acts. Two weeks ago, we left off on Acts chapter 16, and there's a lot going on in that chapter, so we're going to get back to that in a minute. Uh, Before we do, I just wanted to say that uh, the website that we have for our church, the church that sponsors the radio show, is Grace and Truth Church from Amherst, New York. And the website for the church is graceand, graceandtruthchurch.org. Now, you can find uh, things about the church. You can find links to different things on our website. But also, if you go to YouTube and you just uh, put in Pastor Michael Caesar, C-E-S-A-R, uh, you'll, you can click on videos there on YouTube and you can watch some of the church services, some of the teachings that uh, Pastor Caesar has had on uh, the book of Revelation or the book of Ezekiel that he's been teaching, some of the new stuff on Genesis, but also there's some old stuff on there that's pretty interesting. Uh, if you've thought that you want to get back into the Bible or get started in the Bible for the very first time, take a look on that website on YouTube with Pastor Michael Caesar and look up the intro to John. That would be referring to John's gospel, you know, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And John's gospel starts out with the phrase, in the beginning. And so about 25 years or so ago, a uh, pastor taught, and it's really, it's a teaching, and it's a great way for you to get back into the Word of God, and uh, it's an easy introduction. So anyway, so that's my rec- recommendation to you. And so, Brother Kevin, we were in chapter 16 of Acts two weeks ago, and then last week, we took a pause and we talked about Israel, and uh, that that was... Uh, that Israel is God's chosen people. And so it was an interesting show, I think, talking about uh, what's going on in Israel today and some of the meaning about the land and who owns the land and all that. But in Acts chapter 16, we had been reading, and we ended up in about verse 20, but we need to back up just a little bit because the beginning of the paragraph is in uh, 16. So here we are in Acts 16, verse 16, and the Bible says... And it came to pass, now I have to understand, I have to make clear what's going on here. This is the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey. And he's on this missionary journey, and he's got uh, uh, Luke is with him. We found that in verse 10. And he also has Silas with him. We find that in the previous chapter in verse 40, Paul and Silas and also Luke. And they're traveling and in Acts 16.11, we found that they were traveling from Troas to Samothria and then to Neapolis. And we noticed there that this is the gospel entering Europe, leaving Asia Minor and entering Europe for the first time. And it says they went to Philippi, which is part of Macedonia. So they're in this region of Macedonia. And here they are, verse 16, and the Bible says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, he turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Kevin, any thoughts on that section there? I I noticed right away that it was a a damsel, but when the spirit came out, it says he came out the same hour. So that devil spirit that was in her was a male spirit, 
even though she was a damsel. Interesting. I didn't notice that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of little details in there, but um, for instance, you could read this and you might have to, you might be a little confused as to what kind of a spirit is in her, but there are clues in here as to what kind of a spirit, because it says that this spirit brought her masters much gain. So there's money involved. They were making money off of her, right? And it says it was a spirit of divination. And uh, two weeks ago, we looked into the book of Deuteronomy in uh, chapter 18, right around verse 10, where it talks about that that's abomination to God. You should not be a diviner. You should not be trying to foretell the future. That's not of God, okay? God has prophecy where he wrote down things that happened before they happen. That's prophecy. It's like history written before it happens. But God doesn't expect men to foretell the future and do divination. That's, that's another spirit. Yeah, so uh, there's folks like Gene Dixon and uh, many others that are soothsayers, right? And just yes. because they get, get it right once in a while doesn't mean you should be following. Some people will follow because they'll point to, well, look at this. Look at where they got this right. Look where they got that right. But God says that uh, anybody that is going to prophesy, they better be right all the time. Amen. If they're wrong one time, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it only takes one item to be wrong on a dollar bill to make it a fraud. Yes. You don't have to have 100. You don't have to have 50, 25. Only one thing makes it a fraud. So uh, that's, here, a good, that's a good example. I mean, if you really stop and think... A lot of times people use one of those markers to check $20 bills, $50 bills, or whatever to make sure that it's a real bill. Real. Yeah. yeah. It could look really legit, well, but if it's not real, it's the worthless. Whole, the whole point of making a something that's a fraud, you want it to be as close as possible to the real McCoy. So it's going to be close. Yeah. Uh, but it's not going to look uh, like you know, Monopoly if you, money. If you notice, <laughs> yeah, if you notice one thing, yeah. if you notice one thing that's wrong, that makes it a fraud. That's right. all it takes. And it makes it worthless. And in a case of uh, some things, if it's a fraud, it's, it's worse than worthless. It's actually dangerous. Uh, I, I jump back to Deuteronomy 18 for a minute. We read this two weeks ago, but I think it's uh, worthy to read again. In Deuteronomy 18.10, God gives a warning, and he tells you what he thinks about divination. In Deuteronomy 18.10, it's a, he says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. He says, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Maybe our listeners don't know what abomination is. Go, uh, well, abomination is something that is God is uh, fully against. Like it, it's it's a horrible thing. It's uh, you're you're going the opposite way from God. I mean, it takes faith in order to please God. It's not just something wrong. It's something that let's say almost could make God uh, sick. Yeah. Of looking at it, like it's disgusting. It's it's. It's abominable. It's, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I was just thinking that, you know, a lot of folks may be ab abomination. What's that? Have, you know. Right. It's kind of an old word. Yes. Yeah. But uh, it's, re it's really a strong word. Yes. That God is uh, strongly wording that word that these things are disgusting to him. And it's gonna, absolutely it's gonna, disgusting. And it's going to draw his wrath. Well, well why, why wouldn't it? Because they're deceiving people. Yeah, they're going and God's to, not interested in people that deceive others for gain, like we have here. For money, yep. They're doing it for money or for power or for anything. It's like uh, God is interested in, he's a God of truth. He's not not interested in de deception, deceiving. Right. And yet we see this certain damsel, and she's not even deceiving. She's saying the truth in there. She cried and saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God. That is true. That is true. 
Yep. Which show unto us the way of salvation. And what were they doing? They That's were showing they were the way of salvation. They were preaching the gospel. Right. Yeah. So the the problem here is, um, you know, why didn't why didn't Paul just go? Hey, yeah, she's right. Listen to her. Right. He he wants no part of it. It's the wrong spirit. It's the wrong spirit, and it's the wrong authority. Where's where's the source of that spirit coming from? Is it coming from God? No. You know. So 1 Corinthians 2.12 says that we're not to receive the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. So here's somebody telling truth, but it's the wrong spirit. And so Paul has a very strong reaction to it. He's grieved in verse 18. And then he commands, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Amen. So it's the problem is, is not true or falseness and not necessarily uh well it is the spirit but it's the final authority what is the source of that what is the source of that so you've got somebody like gene dixon telling the future where's she getting that from from beneath right. not from above right. jesus yeah. said i am from above you are from below right right and, so. and, and it's a matter of discernment to understand that you want to follow after God and after his ways, and you don't want to go against him. I mean, why would you go against almighty God when you're doing that? You're going to draw his wrath. And so, like it says back in Deuteronomy, he, he it's an abomination if you're a, a d diviner or a witch or a wizard or a necromancer. Necromancing means talking to the dead. I mean, we hear about that kind of stuff in our day in the year 2023, uh, I heard about it on the radio today, just driving around town when I was flipping through radio stations. They were talking about, you know, um, haunted houses because yeah, Halloween's we getting close. Celebrate it in a few days. Yeah, when Halloween we're is celebrate like next. evil and horror and blood and guts and death. we're going to celebrate it. Death. Yeah, celebrate death. Yeah. God says, "Those that hate me love death." Right, and it's a strange, dark Halloween holiday, and. Um, it's got some biblical roots, actually. I wasn't planning on getting into Halloween, but if anybody's curious, if you go in 1 Kings chapter 12, uh, it talks about this sin. I'll, I'll just go to it real fast since we touched on it. Pretty sure it's at the end of uh, chapter 12. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it's talking about Jeroboam, and Jeroboam, it mentions him in uh, 1 Kings 12, 20. And he was made king. This was when Israel and Judah were split into two kingdoms, 10 kingdoms and two kingdoms. And uh, in verse 28, the king, Jeroboam, he made two calves of gold. And he says, it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel. And he put one calf of gold in Bethel and the other one he put in Dan. This is at the end of 1 Kings 12. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. You can't make priests that were not of the priestly line. Anyways, and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month. That would be right around pretty close to October 31st. And so he did that. And it says, verse 33, at the end of the chapter, so he, Jeroboam, he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, on the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, yeah, of his own wicked heart, and he ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Now think about that. He's doing a priestly duty, but he's the king. He's, he's taking a, two he's offices, yeah. two offices, priest and king. And that is a type or a picture of something evil. God says that you have to separate those offices. It's actually, you think about it like the U.S. government is separated into executive, legislative, and judicial branch. And you're not supposed to have authority over more than one, right? It's a wicked thing. And so it's, it's a, what do they call that? It's a separation of power, right? And here... This guy, Jeroboam, he does this great sin, and you read about it throughout the Old Testament, the sin of Jeroboam, which happened on Halloween, okay? Uh, he made two gods and says, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. You can just go to Dan or Bethel, and you can worship there to these calf, calves of gold. 
And that was a wicked thing. And he was king and priest. That's a little bit like the Pope. The Pope is the king of the Vatican, and he's also the high priest of the Vatican. It's not a good thing. It's not a biblical good thing at all. So God any, is very specific about who the priestly tribe is. It has to be the sons of Aaron, right. the tribe of Levi. Yep. And so there were a number of folks that uh, got involved in that kind of stuff, some of the kings and others that just weren't even of that priestly tribe. And uh, God is very specific about those things. Yes. God is very, uh, he's very interested in truth. And when he tells us to do things, um, well, I was thinking of Ezekiel twenty two twenty six, also, because uh, it says, her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. God's all about holiness. Yes. He, he, uh, you're not supposed to touch any unclean thing. The, the Nazarite vow was not to touch any unclean thing. You know, and you had somebody like Samson that broke his Nazarite vow, and he touched unclean things. The unclean things could also be uh, like dead animals. He touched touched uh, dead, dead animals. Lion. Yep. But God is interested in in holiness and truth, and He says her priests have violated, and He's talking about uh, uh, Israel here. They violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Hmm. Neither have they shown difference between the unclean and the clean. There's a difference between holy and profane. Amen. Uh, you know, we're, we're not to mix those things, right? Uh, a priest should be involved in priestly things. Should they be involved in the day-to-day -day operation like a king? No. Uh, you know, executive branch, things like that. A priest should talk about holy things, right? Absolutely. Shouldn't be involved in... Um, Wicked things. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> money. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, a draw of money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the blessing of the animals or, you know... Right. Just, you know, secular things. Right. Um, but, but like this verse talks about, it, it's they put no difference between the holy and the profane. Where is the discernment to know the difference between good and evil, right? Between light and darkness and not to mix them up, right? How do they mix? You, how, do you, how do you mix light and darkness? What do you come out with? You, you're not mixing. You're actually going either you're going well, in one direction or you're going in the other well, direction. It's, you're going to take light and it's going to become cloudy. Right. It's, it's not going to be light anymore. Um, the Bible says, uh, Jesus said, be careful that the light that is within you is not darkness. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And back in the book of Acts where we were, you've got this damsel with a spirit of divination, right? And she was bringing her masters much gain by soothsaying. Soothsaying, we mentioned this two weeks ago, pastor said, it's like speaking soothing words, but for monetary gain, soothsaying. And so we saw in both in Ezekiel, we saw also in Deuteronomy just a, a minute ago that you don't want to go after abominable things, things that God says are wrong and sin, right? And if you want to stay away from that, that, that would be the evil spirit, and this is an evil spirit. These days, people seem to, if you're not reading the Bible, you don't, have, to it. <laughs> you don't have much discernment to stay away from darkness. And so... On a regular basis, I hear people talking about how this world's crazy, right? This world's nuts. I can't believe what people are doing these days. And I say, well, it's not just crazy. It's not just nuts. It's actually dark. It's dark times. It's almost like living in the dark ages or something. That's what I think about sometimes. I see, I see people walking around in Buffalo with burkas on where they're all covered and all you can see is just their eyes, just a slit for their eyes. I'm like, didn't they do this back in the dark ages? Oh, the barbarians are at the gate. <laughs> yeah. So, but the reason why things are so dark is because people have gotten away from the light and they have lost discernment. You have to spend time in the Word of God. You have to feed on a spiritual diet of God's Word. Just like you have to eat physical food, you have to eat spiritual food. Right? 
how would you know the difference between the holy and the profane? I mean, we just read about teaching. Ezekiel 44 talks about a priest that does the right job. It says, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. You know, there are people who make no difference. There's right. no difference, right? You, you can, uh, let's go to church on Sunday and then on Monday, what happens? There's no difference. Right. There's no difference on Sunday. There's no difference on Monday. It's all the same. And it's, uh, it says, they teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. You've used that word a number of times. You've talked about discernment, yeah. discerning. How can you discern if you don't know what the clean is and you don't know what the unclean is? If you make no difference between the clean and the unclean, and how can you know what's clean and what's unclean? The, the Bible says, sanctify them through... Uh, thy truth, thy word is truth. This is how we know what's clean and what's unclean. That's because it's not normal for us as human beings to make that discernment. Why did we have to have teachers? Why did these guys have to teach God's people? Because by nature, we choose the wrong things. We don't choose the right things. You don't have to teach babies to right. you know to do the right things I mean, you they're, do you they're, have to natu teach them the, they're naturally drawn they're to the wrong naturally things. going to be slapping each other and yeah. give me that candy they're going to be selfish you have to teach them to love one another and, and so that you just hit on it when you're teaching children i jump back in deuteronomy to chapter one where it's talking about joshua who comes after moses and he says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse uh, 39, Moreover, your little ones, talking about the, the children, which ye, said, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, that they should go in thither. So little kids don't have knowledge between good and evil, and throughout the Old Testament, God commands Israel to teach their children his ways. And some people don't have to be little children. They could be full-grown adults and still don't know the difference. Right. Like you just said, they're just like little children. Yeah. You know, the Bible, the God tells us to be like little children when it comes to certain things. Yeah. You know, to be innocent. Yes. But uh, in other things, we should be wise. We should be wise about things that can hurt us, that can hurt others. And, you know... That takes responsibility, and a lot of people don't want to have responsibility. But going the good way, God's way is always best. And so following his way is always the right thing to do. It's the right way to go. Um, so anyway, so it's good to have discernment, and you get that discernment from reading the Bible. I think of it this way as an illustration. Uh, I have a friend who's a mechanic, and one day I said something to him. I said just kind of jokingly, I go, well, we could always grab some duct tape and just duct tape it. And he goes, what's duct tape? And I go, everybody knows what duct tape is. And he goes, mechanics don't know what duct tape is. He goes, oh. that's, that's not the right way to go, right? Does that make sense? So there's a lot of things in life where you have a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And uh, you need discernment to make sure you're going the right way. So one, one thing I was thinking of is there are certain religions that will mix the holy and the profane. Okay. They will mix paganism try to mix it with Christianity. With Bible. With Bible. Yeah. Right? It, the two don't go together. It's like trying to mix oil and water. It doesn't work. Because paganism is about false gods. Right. Yeah. And, and God won't accept it. That's what we were just reading. God won't accept that. Right. Um, I have a, a, quote, a quote here uh, from a, uh, a particular so source. And uh, this religion... They take paganism, and they have no problem with mixing it with their practice, with their rites, and so on and so forth, and their ceremonies. So they said, it is interesting to note how often our church has availed herself of practices which were in common use among pagans. Is that a good idea? Sound like a good idea to you? No. Okay. No, and you ought to have discernment to stay away from that kind of stuff. Right. Thus, it is true in a certain sense that some... Rites and ceremonies are a reproduction of those pagan creeds. Now, if you're practicing pagan creeds and pagan rites, are you really a Christian or are you a pagan? That's my question. Yeah, you, you, need, to, uh, you need to follow God and his word. Otherwise, you're following another spirit. And so, so here we are. 
Uh, that's it's a good lesson to uh, to understand. Like it says in the book of Isaiah, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. And so people need to read. And even if you're not a good reader, you need to hear. In Deuteronomy, the the Shema from Israel it says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord." So you need to read. You need to hear. These days, people can hear all different uh, methods with their phones, with computers, with radio, with TV, internet. There's lots of ways that you can just pull up a Bible app and get a King James Bible with that pure word of God and listen to it, right? And read along, follow along with the Bible. So anyways, here, here we are, Acts 16. We left off at verse 19. And the Bible says, and when her masters, this would be the, the damsel with the, that was possessed, when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, and they drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. Yeah. And they brought them to the magistrates. That would be like the judges, right? Saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. That would be to beat Paul and Silas. And when they had laid many stripes upon them and cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So here we see that uh, these people, they got mad when all of a sudden their money got interfered with. This was how they were making money off of this certain damsel that had this uh, evil spirit. And then when the evil spirit was cast out by Paul, all of a sudden they knew that their way of making money wasn't going to be the same anymore. So they uh, go to the magistrates and the magistrates, what do they do? They, uh, first of all, they, they accuse them, verse 21, of doing, it's a lie. They said that they're teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive neither to observe being Romans. So I think what's going on there is in Rome, they looked at Caesar as God, right? They would say, hail Caesar. And there, there's no other God but Caesar. So here they're talking about that Jesus is God and that uh, he deserves worship and that he rose from the dead. So uh, as, as we're here in this, we're running almost to the halfway point, so we need to take a station break here in a minute. But uh, I want you to stay tuned after the station break, and we're going to get into the rest of Acts chapter 16. And there's some really good, interesting stuff going on here where uh, they get broken out of the prison by God. And the uh, jailer asks, what must I do to be saved? So we're going to take our station break, and we'll be with you back in a minute. Want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Do like Jesus said. Search the scriptures, and you'll know what is true. Amen. And welcome back to the What Is Truth Radio Show. Here we are, uh, Kevin Deegan and Mark Sassy. We're going through uh, Acts chapter 16, and we are up to about verse oh, 24 in the chapter, but. Uh, as we were reading through this, and we were seeing that you need discernment between good and evil, between light and darkness, and to not go after an evil spirit, but to stay and follow God's spirit. Kevin, you had something that you were thinking about. You were saying that you... you well, you can't ahead. mix light with darkness, right? right? God says to have some separation between the holy and the profane. So how much profaneness do you want in your life? How much profaneness do you want in your Bible, even? Well, I got, I got a cup of water here, right. and I wouldn't want it to be not pure water. I right. wouldn't want a little bit of like a cap full of bleach. Well, most, I wouldn't want that in there. Well, you don't even need a cap full. Usually like a, just a single drop or less than a drop. How about some of these new drugs? A grain of sand can kill you. Dropped in that bottle of water, uh, one all. little grain. The way Jesus said, he said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Right. Right? How much poison do you want in your pure water? I want no poison exactly. in my water. Okay. None. So and if we look at, uh, if we look at, uh, if you look at your Bible and you look at uh, 2 Samuel 
21, Second verse 19, Samuel. I believe. Second Samuel 21. Verse 19. Verse 19. So you're, and, you're comparing something that would be pure versus not pure. Right. Okay, so 2 Samuel 21. Why, why don't you read it out of the King James? Verse 19. So here it is in the King James Bible. It says, And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jerugim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, so it says that the Bible says yes. that Elhanan slew the brother of Goliath. Now, that makes sense because everyone knows that David killed Goliath the giant. I learned that in Sunday school. Right. Uh, <laughs> I knew that as a little kid. So that's a so, pretty well-known Bible yes. fact. David killed Goliath. So why do many of these new Bibles say Elhanan, right here in this verse, you check it out, 2 Samuel 21, verse 19. If your Bible says Elhanan killed Goliath, what kind of Bible do you have? Uh, how, much, how much poison do you want with your pure water? Well, it talks. the Bible talks about itself as if it's like water. Yes, pure water. Pure right? water, yeah. right? In, in uh, Isaiah 55, the Bible's compared to water. In Deuteronomy 32... He says, my, my dew, my doctrine comes down like dew, like water, Deuteronomy 32. And also in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible, the words of God are compared to water. You want pure water. You don't want corrupt or poisoned water. Yeah. Now, if I, if I offered you a $100 bill and it was orange, <laughs> right, you can see it. But why would somebody take a Bible that says Elhanan killed Goliath and then try to convince you that that's the word of God? Well, but it's here's the, same the excuse. As me the excuse convincing is you this hundred dollar bill, this orange hundred dollar bill, is a real McCoy. Yeah, it's the same thing. Right. It's like, why would you try to convince me that that's the real McCoy? I know what the real McCoy is. So the deception with every one of the modern Bibles, the new Bibles, is that they're easier to read. But that's honestly, it's not true. This language in the King James Bible is actually God's language. It's not some Elizabethan English from the 1600s. It's not that. It's different than Shakespeare. Well, people today want a, want a God that speaks with the same slang words they speak with. Right. They want the word of God, almighty God. They want his words to be condensed and processed and put in a blender like some kind of baby food pablum that's what they want yeah it's this is the word of god right this this word gives life Amen. this word is eternal forever oh lord thy word is settled in heaven Amen. and then you want to take it and bring it down to your level well it says in uh Oh, I forgot what chapter of Proverbs, but it's every word of God is it's pure. pure. Proverbs 30, 30, verse 5. Yeah, I knew it was verse 5 of some yeah. chapter. I couldn't remember which chapter. But every, anyways, every word. Every does, word. Does that say all of the words except 2 Samuel 21, 19? No. It and says it's, every word of God. So if every word is not pure, you got a problem. is it the word of God? It is not. Exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a counterfeit. It's it's a phony. <laughs> it's and, an orange hundred dollar bill, right? And you you know the gas station attendant. How could you miss he it? He wouldn't take it. How could you miss it? Yeah. So why should you take what yeah. they claim to be an easier easier to read? The other lie that I find too with modern Bibles is this: a lot of pastors these days will say you should have a comparative Bible with about five different versions in it, so you can get a better understanding of what that what that verse really says, but that's not true. That's confusion. Well, that, that's what I do when I buy a car. I want five different uh, titles, and I want five different contracts, <laughs> and I'll take the one that has the lowest price on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. It, no, it doesn't work at all. Yeah. It's like, why do we use contracts? This is a contract between us and God. Amen. This is the promise of God. God promised eternal life. If I can't trust this book with the words here, how can I trust my eternity with these words? If these words are not reliable, how can I trust it? You're bringing up a good point. Trusting God is trusting his word. 
It's and, his promise, and, and, his word. And people used to, decades ago, they used to really read the Bible and trust God and trust his word. And they knew what God was like. They knew his thoughts and, and his intents and the way that he goes. But these days, people seem so far away from that because they don't trust him anymore. You really need to trust his word. How can I even know him yeah. if I don't read his word? How can I know him? Right. He's not like us. He's not one of us. Yeah. He had to lower himself to become like us. He said, I am from above, you are from beneath. Well, to know him, he says in John chapter 10, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Yes. And so you don't want some other voice. You want God's pure voice. You want a King James Bible in English. Now, there's other Bibles of other languages throughout the world where God has preserved his word perfectly, pure. Okay, Spanish Valera Bible is one example of it. There's other ones. But the point is, is that it has to be God's pure words. Otherwise, you're going to be led in the wrong direction. You're going to be deceived and not have discernment. And you're going to end up thinking that El Hinnon killed Goliath. But no, we all know David did. Right. So anyway, so back to Acts where we were. So they, Paul casts out this, this evil spirit from the certain damsel and her masters, they're, they're losing money over it. Their hope of their gains was gone, it says in verse 19. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and they brought them to the magistrates, which they beat them. And they, uh, they, after they beat them, it says they laid many stripes upon them and they cast them into prison. And they charged the jailer to keep them safely, who that jailer who received such a charge, he thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stock. So not only were they way in the prison, but they got whipped, they got beaten, and now they've got their feet in the stocks. You remember what stocks are, right? Like those wooden stocks? Yeah. I'm sure... Lots of folks have seen the pictures of uh, up in uh, like Boston, Massachusetts and stuff at the founding of this country uh, and over in England. You know, Even if you in got, the Wild West, I think they used to do it sometimes. I, I don't know about that, but I know like if uh, you got in trouble, they'd put you in the stocks. Yeah. Sometimes it, your hands and your feet. Right. Yeah. Not, not just your feet. Yeah. And so after you've been whipped and beaten and then you're stuck in that, that's pretty uncomfortable. So... Uh, any quick comments or should we move on? Okay, let's move on. So in verse 25, it says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and he sprang in, and he came trembling, and he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Let's stop there for a second. There's a lot going on here. God moved in mightily, and he actually opened up the doors of the prison after he did a great earthquake. So he used a natural occurrence. After what, though, in verse 25? Yeah. And when it was, I mean, here they are. They've been beaten, thrown in jail. To make matters worse, they're th they're in stocks. They're chained, probably chained up whipped. behind bars, whipped, bleeding. Yep. Because later on, it says that the jailer cleaned up their their yes. stripes. Yes. Uh, so they had wounds. Right. Open probably wounds. in a really dirty prison. Yeah. And they didn't used to be like today's prisons. And it says at midnight, when it was darkest, ah. at the darkest hour. Amen. These guys, just think if it was you. You, you, maybe you give up all hope. You might be grumbling, saying, why, Lord? Why'd you stick me here? Well, What'd you do this? If it's this bad already and you're in jail, what's coming tomorrow? Right. What do you think they're thinking at midnight? Not these guys. They weren't thinking that at midnight. At midnight, they were, they were saying praises to God. 
and the other prisoners after they heard got them. beat, they praised God. Amen. And they prayed. And what happened? God showed up. Amen. At the darkest time, God showed up. Amen. Sometimes yeah. God waits till the darkest time, too, that to see if you're going to have faith. I mean, they could have grumbled, right? Yes. But they didn't. They sang praises to him. Honestly, you talk about this. God tests people. Yes. Right? He tested yeah. Abram, right? Are you willing to offer your son? He's testing them, and they passed the test. And not just for them, but so that they can see where... I, I believe that the testing is so they can see where they're really at. You know, when, it, when the rubber meets the road... How right. are you going to behave? Right. Number one. But number two, this is a prison. How come all the other guys didn't leave when the gates opened? Oh, all the other prisoners, you mean, besides Paul and Silas? Yes. So maybe part of it is these guys are sitting in there going, I'm not happy. What's wrong with these guys singing praises <laughs> to God in the yeah. middle of the night, midnight? Yeah. They've been beaten, probably mistreated really bad. And they probably saw him being dragged into the cells, thrown in the cells. And all these guys are seeing this, observing this. Well, and they're praising God. These guys are getting the testimony through these guys, I, through even though they're suffering. I would say not only a testimony, but they just saw, these other prisoners, they just saw and experienced an act of God. Well, and they, they heard, probably heard these guys praying. Because they probably weren't praying like this. Right. So they're they probably, heard that. It, well, you know, it says, it clearly I, says in verse 25, the prisoners heard them. So God there, made, it, there God go. made yeah. it a point to let you know these prisoners heard these, these missionaries, right? And they heard them praying and they heard them singing praises to God in their darkest hour. And all of a sudden this earthquake happens. So now imagine you're a prisoner you do? in there. What you would, would you do? I just heard these guys praying, and all of a sudden, this huge the, whole place, the whole place is shaking. <laughs> and all the doors and my, open. And my door opened. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. I want to see what's coming next. <laughs> right, right. So, so it's pretty amazing. Immediately, all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. So if people were chained in the prison, and they had bands on their, maybe on their wrists or maybe on their ankles, their bands were loosed. How do you explain that? It has to be God. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, that's probably why they didn't leave. They could, what's the first thing a prisoner wants to do wanna, when you're in jail? <laughs> they want to run. I want to run. And yeah. somebody opens the door and you don't run? Yeah. Explain that. That's because they... I mean, all they think about is, I want to get out of here. Every day, I want to get out of here. Yeah. Tomorrow, I want to get out of here. The next day, I want to yeah. get out of here. Somebody opens the door and they stay. So in their minds, they must have been saying, surely this is of God. You know, it's almost like at the cross when the Roman soldier, when he saw yeah, Jesus. This, this, this is a this, miracle. Yeah, this is a miracle. And so we see here that the, uh, the prisoner, the keeper of the prison, so that would be like the warden, but it says the keeper of the prison, he, he drew his own sword and he would have committed suicide. Verse 27, it says he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Now, you know and I know, but maybe not the general listeners, the reason why he was willing to commit suicide is because Roman law was that if you let a prisoner escape, then you're worthy of death. It's a death penalty. But it might have been more than just a death penalty. It might have been torture and the death penalty because he was willing to stick himself through with his own sword. He would rather have that than be handed over to the authorities after this, right? And so... But Paul tells him, do, do thyself no harm, for we're all here. And he called for a light, and he sprang in, and it shows, just by the wording of how God worded this, it shows his heart. He didn't come in proudly. He didn't come charging in there. He came in trembling, and he fell down before Paul and Silas. So he came humble. And, you know, God can work with a humble and a contrite spirit. It says, the Bible says that God resisteth the proud. But he's looking for a humble and a contrite spirit. And here is the keeper of the prison. And, and he asks a great question. This might be one of the best questions in all the Bible in verse 30 of Acts 16. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Question mark. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Those two verses sandwiched together, 30 and 31. That's the question. And that's the answer that every man needs to know. What do you need to do to be saved? Well, he asks 
the question. What does he what does he ask? He says, What must who do? I do. What must I do? Right. And what's the answer? It's very simple. Verse 31, believe. Yes. It's not repent like Judas. Judas repented and hung himself. Right. It's not confess like Balaam. It's not be baptized like Pharaoh. Pharaoh was baptized in the water, in the Red Sea. <laughs> he went straight to hell. Yes. So it wasn't any of those things, not repent, not confess, not be baptized. Just simply believe. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Amen. All to him I owe. That's who did the work. The yes. work, and the Bible says, I don't know where the verse is, the work of God is to believe. That's yes. the work of God. So many people want to do something. I, what must I do? I want to do something. I want to get baptized. I want to repent. I want to do this. I want to do that. Jesus came here and died so that it's the, the penalty is already paid. The price is already paid. Amen. All you have to do is believe. What but, must I do? You can't you, do anything. But You're you already guilty. It. But you must do believe. it. Believe. Yeah. But you just believe. Yes. That's it. It's not all this other stuff that why do people always want to... Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38, well, right? They, they believe the that question they, was not, what must I do to be saved in Acts 2.38? Right. But people go to that, they believe in baptism, baptism, baptism. Right. There's something about human nature that when you get caught, you know you're guilty. You want to do something to clean up the mess. Yes. You want to hide the crime. Yes. You know, I, I always use the example of the little kids. Mommy says, don't take the cookies. Right. You get caught with your hand in the cookie jar. What do you want to do? You want to, it's too late to put the cookie back. You ate it. <laughs> right. So we're already guilty. Yes. Because when we break God's law, that proves what we are. We're a lawbreaker, not a law keeper. We can't keep the law. Th uh, by the works of the law, no flesh is going to be justified. Right. But human nature wants to do something. This guy just said, what must I do? And all he had, the answer was real simple. Believe. believe. Yes. People won't believe it because it's too simple. Well, there must be something I have to do. But, but God made it really simple. You mentioned this verse. It's in John 6, 29. Jesus answered, well, first the question in John 6, 28. They said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. And there's a division between believing and not believing. And you mentioned this earlier today in John three thirty six, at the end of John chapter 3. It's, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's good. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So that's saying that... God's wrath is already abiding on us. There's something you must do. do does it say you have to be baptized there? Nothing about that. Does it say you have to repent there? Nothing about that. Does it say you have to stop all your sin? And no works there. No works. Right. Yeah. It, it just says he that believeth. In John uh, what 3.18 also, he that believeth on him is not condemned. See, I said before, the penalty of our sin was paid by God himself. Amen. In Acts 20, he says that he purchased the church with his own blood. God himself came here and paid and covered our sins with his blood. If we're and willing. so he won't see the sin. If we simply believe what he did, and all that we have to do is believe. Amen. That's what the, the jailer said. So he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Does it say he's condemned already because he wasn't baptized? No. Does it say he's condemned already because he didn't repent? Because he didn't stop sin? Our sins are covered by the blood of, of Jesus Christ. I think it's 1 John what 1-7. Uh, yes. Uh, all sins are yep. covered by his blood. Uh, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. You got a sin problem out there? Then call on the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Acts 2.38, right around there, I think it's 2.39, it says, and call on the name of the Lord. Yes. It's not the baptism. It was the calling on the name of the Lord. Oh, God, what, mu what must I do to be saved? 
It, it, like, the, the whole, how, how about Acts 837? Yeah. Right. Well, see, he believed and water, then he was baptized. He believed first he, and then he was baptized. You must believe. He told, he told as, the, as long as you have a pure King James Bible, because the modern Bible's changed that, that Acts 837. Well, it's one of those orange $100 bills again. Right. Now, <laughs> this whole thing about believing, and you said it's a simple thing, right? Yeah. I always think of at the very end of the Bible, right in, near the end of the last chapter in Revelation, God says, whosoever will may come. You just have to be willing. Yeah. And and I never knew this until just shortly before I got saved. In 1 John 5, 13, the Bible says these things, meaning the things in the Bible, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is the confidence that we have in him. And what does it say there? It says if you don't believe... You make God a liar because this is the promise that God has made he says, to us in this book, in these words. God himself promised us eternal life because he knows there's no way. We cannot do it ourselves. What must I do? You can't do it. You're guilty. Yeah. How are you going to cleanse your sin? What are you going to do? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What exactly are you going to give for your exchange for your soul? What, what? can you give? Well, I guess a perfect example are, are you is... Gonna, are you going to clean your life up? You're going to reform your life? It's too late. You already broke the law. It, right, right. It, you, we were back, we were in First John, and in First John, it yeah. says there in the first chapter, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us from all unrighteousness. That's a pretty power-packed verse, but it, it's showing that we're all sinners before a holy God. And the only way to get right with God is to believe the gospel message, like this Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Why is it that people just won't trust God? What is it about people that I got to do it my way? It's human nature. I'm going to do it my way. I know. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to reform my life. I'm going to join a church. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to whatever it is. It's like, it's real simple. Acts 16, 31. Yes. Believe. And you know why the what Philippian... I, I do. You know why the Philippian jailer didn't come across that way? He didn't come across prideful. He came trembling. He fell down before Paul and Silas. He was, he was ready to throw a, a stick yeah. of sword through himself, right? He wanted to know, what must I do? What must I do? <laughs> he yeah. wasn't there like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. He's like, look, I've come to the end of my rope. Bingo. Yes. I don't know what to do. What must I do? And then that's, that's those words I do just jumps out at me. It's yeah. like, there's nothing you can do except for, because he already did it all. Yes. And that, that's, that's where the whole idea of faith comes in because it's, it's by faith. You see that all through the new Testament, even in the old Testament, but especially in the new Testament in, uh, in Ephesians for by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And it's got to be by faith. You're believing by faith, and you're not just believing any old thing. No, you're believing the, uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's Lord. He is Lord. He is the Lord God Almighty in the flesh. Why would God come here and die on the cross if you could do it yourself? That's a good point. Why, if, if you can stop sinning by yourself, what do you need Jesus for? Well, there again, we just read in 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So you just have to face facts. We're sinners. So Romans 1.16, right? Uh, How gospel. about that verse? Yes. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel? Is it baptism? Is it repentance? Is it stop sin? Is it reform your life? Is it join a church? No. Here's, here's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to look it up, tells you what the gospel is. First five it's verses. death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he did the work. Amen. Okay? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to who? Everyone that believeth. It's a free gift. You can't earn a gift. You can't purchase a gift. You're not gonna. You're not gonna pay God for salvation. Amen. He already purchased it for you. He purchased eternal life for you. He paid the price. He paid the penalty. Why won't you just 
Why won't you just come to him? Why won't you just ask him? Why won't you receive him? The Bible says to as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. You want to become a child of God? Then you need to receive him. You don't need to join a church. I'm not saying don't do good things. I'm not saying don't do good. I'm saying he already, as far as salvation, it's already a done deal. He he died on the cross. He said it's finished. Amen. It is finished. Right. He finished the work on Calvary's answer, cross. The book of Colossians tells me that I am complete in him. I don't need uh, any special gifts. I don't need tongues. I don't need this. I don't need a better church. I don't need a better job. I'm complete in Jesus Christ. What must I do to be saved? There you go. Exactly. There you go. It's plain. The plain truth is right there on the page. And, you know, after they said that, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straight way. And then it says in the next verse, they rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So first he believed, and then later after that he was baptized. Baptism is not the salvation. Believing is the salvation. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing always comes first. Cornelius, uh, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, he believed, and then he was baptized. Cornelius... Uh, Acts 2.38, thousands of people believed. Yeah, and then they get baptized later. So here we are. It's the end Isn't of the that? show. And uh, I really hope that was a blessing to everyone, and it was a blessing to us. And please join us again next week for another episode of What is Truth?